wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about blood sugar imbalance. This is something that we address in our couples coaching program. We include a blood chemistry review, not to diagnose, but to educate really seeing what is going on with your blood sugar levels as well as your A1C. So we're going to talk about why this matters for your fertility, why this is important to address for both men and women, especially if you're getting those blood sugar signs that uh, perhaps you get hangry or you get jittery or shaky and you're like, feed me now. That is causing a crash in your blood sugar and then it's going on a roller coaster throughout the day. So how does food, sleep, stress and more impact your blood sugar, why this is important when you're trying to conceive. Excited for you to listen. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers and really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take a few minutes right now, you can pause this this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. One theme that keeps coming up with the couples in our Fab Fertile Couples Coaching Program is sleep. Whether it's insomnia, having a hard time falling asleep, waking up at night or feeling tired when we wake up, sleep is critical for fertility and hormones. And that's why I'm so excited to have Blue Blocks as our podcast sponsor. So we're exposed to blue and green light from our phones, our tablets, our computers, indoor lights, and more. And this exposure impacts our melatonin production. Melatonin is essential for both female and male fertility. It helps determine the frequency and duration of our cycle and impacts sperm. There's lots of blue light blocking glasses on the market, but the ones from Blue Blocks, they've actually compared other popular brands and Blue Blocks block 100% of blue and green light while other brands fall short. So I have their sleep glasses. They have red lenses and the ones I have are a little translucent uh, frame and they're so stylish and really cool. And so they eliminate 100% of the blue and green light in the 400 nanometer to 550 nanometer range. So this is exact range has been shown in clinical studies to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact your sleep. So all you do is wear your sleep glasses after sunset until it's time for bed and you'll notice improved sleep after just one use. And it's also cool to use when you're flying for managing jet lag. So I got to say, I was a little skeptical about the noticing uh, improvement after one use, but literally I I use these glasses and my sleep is actually already pretty good. I use them for one day. And I have to say, after one day, I had the best sleep of my life. I just felt so rested. So these glasses, they ship free and they're tracked for all orders anywhere in the world. And also they have all their frames come in prescription, non-prescription and reading glasses. Plus you can send in your frames and they'll add the blue light blocking and green light blocking lenses to your frame. So this is an easy hack that you can add to your fertility toolkit. All you do is go to blue blocks, B-L-U-B, lox.com use the coupon code get pregnant podcast at checkout and receive a 15% discount that's blue blocks b l u b l o x.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast to receive your 15% discount i didn't need to go to donor eggs obviously mm-hmm. i don't regret it i have beautiful children i could have done things differently restored i was still cycling back in my in my 20s I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. 
It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the, the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey there, I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Justine Altman back to the podcast, and we're digging into why blood sugar matters if you are trying to conceive. So definitely check out episode number six for a functional medicine one-on-one talk, plus a look at some of the tools we use to help couples conceive. Justine's part of my team here at Fat Fertile. She's an integral part of our couples coaching program, which uses functional lab testing, diet, and lifestyle changes to dramatically improve conception. So if you are struggling with infertility, your body is desperately trying to tell you something. Focusing on your health will either help you get pregnant naturally, or if you do need to go to the fertility clinic, it will improve your chances of success. Justine is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, and she was diagnosed with PCOS and struggled with infertility. She had her first baby with fertility treatments, but after taking a functional approach, was able to conceive her second child naturally. Thanks so much for listening, and I'm so thankful that you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe, and if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Justine, excited to have you back on the podcast. Hey, Sarah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. We are digging into one of our topics that we talk about on a regular basis with our clients and our couples coaching program is blood sugar balance. And uh, so we're going to be taking you through this and really giving you the top tips that we see all the time and really what you can do to to uh, optimize your blood sugar. And this is something that you know, and we'll, we'll get into this, but I had like for years, I'd be like, stop the car. I need food or I'm going to rip someone's head off or I'm just going to pass out. So obviously that's not a good thing. So I was like, my blood sugar was like spiking all over the place. So, so first of all, why is it important for us to look at our blood sugar when we're trying to conceive? Yeah. Well, so the biggest thing is, you know, every time our blood sugar just sort of goes all over the place with this like roller coaster that happens is that it's a stress on the body, right? And so our stress hormone rises, cortisol rises. um, And that really, it takes away from all of the other things, right? The body's trying to keep us safe. And the way I've been sort of explaining it to people lately is that You know, it only takes a really small amount of sugar, like a tablespoon or something in your blood in order for that to be like more than enough that would sort of kill us, right? That has potential for our blood sugar to really spike super high if our body didn't sort of rush in and take care of it and try to sort of keep it balanced. And so when that happens, the body sort of has to go, okay, whoa, 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 let's like stop everything we're doing, hold the presses. We need to take care of this blood sugar issue and make sure that we've got it managed at a reasonable level so that we can keep we can keep him or her safe. Um, and when it does that, right, it's taking away resources from all of the other body areas, right? So especially um, things like the reproductive system and the immune system and the digestive system, right? And so our, now our bodies just aren't doing a very good job of producing hormones or basically producing digestive fluids that help us break down our foods. So essentially, you know, the body's prioritizing what it needs to, which is managing our blood sugar in order to keep us safe and everything else sort of takes a backseat. Yeah. And this is not just for, for women. This is for men and women. Are you seeing anything? Is it more like, what are you seeing as far as, like, I know in our couples, we, we're seeing it with both. What are you seeing with that? Uh, you know, it seems to be pretty similar between men and women. You know, I tend to work with both men and women, and I don't necessarily notice that it affects one more than the other. So I'm not entirely sure what the statistics are nationally. Um, what I can say in general is that as it directly relates to hormone issues, women tend to be more susceptible. 
So in general, women tend to sort of have some faltering going on with their hormones, some imbalance going on with their hormones, sort of in a quicker way than men do. So for example, you know, men and women can sort of live the same rough lifestyle where we're, we don't we, we don't get quite enough sleep and we don't eat quite the right diet and we sort of eat too many carbs and we don't get the right exercise. And men can hold out for quite a lot longer and sort of still be in reasonable shape, whereas women start to tend to notice symptoms more quickly. Um, and that's because they do their hormones take a hit more quickly. Um, and not just the sex hormones like the estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, but also things like thyroid hormone. Um, and so we start to see weight gain and we start to see more sleepiness and sort of just other symptoms. Um, whereas men sort of, like I said, they, their bodies seem to hold out a little bit longer, but in general, they tend to get sort of some of these, the same like low blood sugar or high blood sugar, uh, symptoms in, in quite the same way. And when we do testing with our clients, we see it quite a lot in, in men and women. And so as far as insulin resistance, let's, uh, let's dig into that. And what exactly is it? Yeah. So this is sort of my favorite stuff to talk about because I, I really sort of love giving in, getting into the nerdy sort of aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of the chemistry is, you know, we get sugar directly from the foods that we eat, right? So especially from sugars that we eat, but also from other carbs, right? And so the, the more pure sugar we take in, the more directly that affects our blood sugar. And the more complex the carbs are, the slower that affects our blood sugar. And then of course, proteins and fats are sort of even a slower response. But ultimately, the body does convert all proteins and fats into, into carbs, into, into glucose as well. When we eat food and we swallow it down, it goes down into our digestive tract. And then through the lining of our digestive tract, we absorb it into our bloodstream. And so this is where the sugar ends up. It goes through our bellies and into our bloodstream. And the blood is sort of like our delivery system throughout the body, right? So it, it takes the sugar and other nutrients as well. And that's how it delivers basically everything to every cell in the body, right? So to every organ, every system, every, you know, piece of muscle tissue and fat tissue. So basically every cell needs all of these nutrients, right? It needs the glucose, which is really sort of the fuel for our cells. Um, to do all the things, whatever it is that cells jobs, it, its role is in the body. Um, the glucose fuels that along with the vitamins and minerals that also get delivered by the blood. One of the things to note here again is that the, the proteins and the fats, they have, the body has to convert them to sugar. So it does raise the blood sugar when we eat proteins and fats, but not at all like sugar and, and other carbs do because the body doesn't really have to do much work to convert those. They just sort of hit the bloodstream right away. And so sugar, especially like pure sugar, right? So if you were to take a teaspoon of pure sugar, right, that's really going to spike your blood sugar fast. Whereas the more complex carbs will spike your blood sugar a little more slowly. Proteins would spike your blood sugar more slowly than that. And fats even more slowly than that, because it really takes a lot of energy. Well, I don't know that I want to say energy, but it takes a lot of time basically for the body to convert those to glucose that the body can use for energy. And because fats and proteins take longer to break down, the body, it doesn't spike the blood sugar in quite the same way. And so it's sort of like this slow delivery of sugar to the system that the body can tolerate, really. When this happens, we, we also have this hormone called insulin, right? And insulin is a hormone that the pancreas makes, and it's what allows the cells to absorb and use glucose. So basically, insulin makes, or, or pancreas makes insulin, and insulin is what tells the cells, okay, we want you to accept glucose now. We want you to take glucose into your, into your cells so that you can use it as energy. And when we have stress in the body, cortisol counteracts insulin and leads to insulin resistance. Now, we don't, like science doesn't entirely understand exactly why this happens, this whole sort of insulin resistance piece. But in general, when we have unhealthy habits, we're prone to developing insulin resistance. We know this. We know that things like too much sugar and carbs in the diet or foods that cause inflammation, so things like grains and dairy for, for a lot of people, um, or any foods that we have sensitivities to, or you know, not getting enough rest, not sleeping enough hours, or not getting enough movement, or having belly fat, or smoking, all of those things we know are directly related to a person's likelihood of developing insulin resistance. And then when people have insulin resistance, the cells are unable to use insulin effectively. So the pancreas makes more and more insulin so the sugars can get into the cells, right? Because we need those sugar, the sugars to, to come from the blood and go into the cells in order to power the things the cell needs to do. But when the cells can't absorb enough glucose uh, because there isn't enough insulin, because the cells start to become insulin resistant, right? So we need more insulin in order for them to sort of get the picture, like to get to get the message that they still need to be taking in the glucose. Then the levels of sugar start to build up in the blood, right? Because if that sugar, it's in the system, it's the blood is trying to deliver it to the cells, but the cells are not taking it, 
then that sugar stays in the blood. And so now the sugar starts to build up in the blood and we get high blood sugar. And high blood sugar is really a problem, mm -hmm. right? It's really a danger to us. It's a threat to our safety. So the pancreas keeps trying to produce more insulin, but eventually it just can't keep up with the demands anymore. It can't make enough insulin to tell the cells, to give the cells enough signals to take in enough of the sugar. And that sugar just hangs out in the blood instead. And then we end up with, with all of the issues related to blood sugar imbalance, right? So, and, or diabetes, right? And it can lead into diabetes. And so, you know, it's, it's connected to all sorts of things, but, but people can have blood sugar issues where they're high or low. Um, you know, it, it manifests in so many different ways for different people, but you know, any, anyone out there who's had, you know, who's been able to say like, man, I'm hangry right now. That's almost always related to something, some kind of irregularity going on with the blood sugar, right? Because if you had nice stable blood sugar from, from long burning fuel, like a good, a good diet sort of rich in, in nutrients and good fats and proteins, you'd be able to stay stable much longer where you sort of wouldn't get those hangry symptoms or any of the other symptoms that can go along with, with blood sugar, like you were talking about earlier, Sarah. And it was the same for me for many, many years. You know, if I didn't eat regularly enough, and for me, it was, it was, it was bad, just like it was for you, it sounds, you know, by regularly enough, it was like, I had to eat like every hour. Um, and if I didn't, you know, man, I just, I, not only did I feel shit, you know, weak and shaky and hangry, but also, you know, I would get massive headaches and I would get so sick to my stomach that occasionally I actually would even puke. Oh, wow. Um, so it was really bad to where you know, my body just couldn't tolerate it. It really needed another addition of sugar to keep trying to get sugar into my cells. My body was really just screaming like this is, we're not okay here. Yeah. Not safe. Exactly. I know it's, yeah, for me, it was, it was that, so let's, let's talk about, it was that jittery and that irritable and like feed me now. And mine wasn't every hour, but it was like, if I was, if I was not, if I missed my, you know, my breakfast, lunch, or dinner, stand back. It's not, it's not a good thing. So I think, and now I, I can, I can go longer and I'm not in a, in a panic. because I'm able to ha focus more on, on fats and proteins. Cause before I was having all kinds of muffins and all my snacky stuff. Okay. So, and, and as far as it's being linked, so contributing factors here, can you kind of talk about some of those other things you're talking about? As maybe going to gestational diabetes and some other things like that that you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So for the most part, you know, it's the same kind of stuff we talk about all the time in functional medicine, right? It's about having a diet that's really nutrient dense for us and really avoids things that are causing inflammation and getting the right rest and getting the right exercise and making sure that we're managing stress, right? And every kind of stress. So, you know, internal stressors on the body as well as sort of the, you know, mental, emotional, daily grind kind of stress. Because, you know, anything that's the opposite of those things are certainly contributing factors to um, to blood sugar issues and insulin resistance. So things like obesity, um, especially if you tend to carry uh, weight in the belly or if you're inactive, right? So we go to work, we sit at a desk all day and then we come home and we sit down for dinner and then we sit down a little while uh, in front of the TV. You know, that, so that kind of lifestyle where we're not getting out there, we're not getting active, we're not getting fresh air, we're not challenging our muscles and our heart. Um, that can certainly contribute to um, to blood sugar dysregulation as well as, like you said, diet high in carbs, right? So it was the same for me. I think I was maybe even worse off than you, Sarah, as far as... Uh, you know, I would eat, literally would eat marshmallows for breakfast some days when I was in college. Um, and, you know, back then I thought it was okay because, you know, we were taught that fat, eating fat is what makes you fat, right? And we know today, fortunately, we know today that that's not the way that it goes, that it's, that's the sugar and the carbs that make us fat. But I literally thought I was doing okay because I was eating fat free. Little did I know I was really, really wrecking, wrecking my body at the time. Fortunately, as, as you and I both know, we can, you know, we do have the power to turn it around and to really get it back and to really change the situation. But all of those things, the diet high in carbs, having gestational diabetes, um, having other health conditions like uh, a sluggish liver or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, PCOS is another um, sort of link to, to blood sugar issues. Um, we don't know exactly all of the, the connections between the two, but we know that if you have PCOS, you're more likely to have blood sugar issues and vice versa. And then of course, you know, there's some level of genetics uh, at play here. So someone can be more predisposed to diabetes than someone else. Although I always like to tell people, you know, the genetics, uh, I don't have a, a sort of a better uh, metaphor for this, but I've heard it say a number of times, genetics loads the gun and, you, and your behaviors pull the trigger or decide whether or not to pull the trigger. Right. So, you know, you can be predisposed to diabetes, but you still get to control through the way that you take care of yourself, whether or not diabetes actually happens for you. And then things like smoking and age. So, of course, you know, the older we get, the more challenging it is to manage 
anything related to our health. Um, it doesn't mean impossible. It just means we, we can't always get away with the things we could get away with eating when we were 15 or 20. Um, and then ethnicity, certain ethnicities are more likely to develop blood sugar issues. So again, the same thing that's, that sort of goes along with genetics, right? So that's a genetics related thing. It doesn't mean that you, that, you know, blood sugar issues are your destiny. It just means there's a possibility that you may have to work a little harder um, than somebody else to, to make sure that it doesn't, that it doesn't happen. And then of course, you know, there are other, other things that can contribute toxins in our environment and medications and things like that. Things that just sort of throw our body chemistry off. Those can all be contributing factors to blood sugar issues. And sleep problems too, which we'll go into a little bit of it. So like sleep apnea as well. Mm -hmm, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do we test blood sugar? Yeah. So testing blood sugar is actually not very hard. So it's a super easy blood test. It happens, you know, your doctors run them all the time. Usually they're looking at a couple of different things. So glucose is the, is one of the markers. Um, hemoglobin A1C is another one. And then sometimes doctors will test insulin as well. Um, so these are the most common. They're all a little different. So glucose is a measurement of what, of your, the amount of sugar in your blood right Right now. And this is important because it gives us feedback about what's going on in your body right this second. But it changes quite a lot. I've actually done some some blood sugar testing over the years. Um, I test occasionally and I work with clients to do the same thing. But there was a time when I was sort of really getting to know my body where I really got nerdy about it. And I, after a meal, essentially, I wanted to find out exactly when it is my spike happened. And so I would test like every five minutes over the span of a couple of hours, just to sort of see like, how long does it take for me to spike? What is the peak of the spike? And then how, how rapidly does it come back down? And so I can tell you from having done that, the blood sugar changes a huge amount, right? So like from one minute, you can be at like a 91 and then the next minute you can be at like 120. Um, and so that's a really significant difference, right? Because the, the numbers that we're talking about as far as what, what a good healthy glucose level is, is a pretty small window. And so a, a change of, of 30 points is dramatic. And that's why we test hemoglobin A1C as well. And that's because it's not uh, affected by what's going on at the exact moment. So it's not like glucose in, in that regard. Instead, it's an average of sort of the amount of sugar that's in your blood in general over the last three months. And so it's sort of a better measurement of, of sort of the, the amount of, of blood sugar imbalance that you might have um, over time, right? And so it doesn't give you a picture of exactly what's going on right now, but it really is sort of like a, a better overall marker for for what does your glucose health look like. That one is one that's run, you know, every once in a while. So it's something that we do obviously with our clients, where we take a look at that to see sort of what their their blood sugar levels look like in general over time. But then also the glucose is really useful in the moment because it helps us sort of get a baseline for what glucose levels look like uh, when someone is fasting. And then also after a meal is my favorite time to do it. And the reason is because if we do testing after a meal, it, it lets us sort of learn what kind of meals serve our body the best based on how much our blood sugar spikes. So for example, you know, if you eat a meal where uh, it's a bowl full of pasta with chicken and maybe some spinach and a piece of garlic bread on the side, um, and you test your blood sugar an hour later and you've hit something you know, above 120, 120 is sort of a, the gold standard, but say you hit 160 or 180, that's sort of our clue that that was too much. And that 120 number is the number that I recommend to clients. So that that's our clue that that was too much in that setting. Um, and by too much, much, it means maybe too much carbs. It means maybe too much food in general. So a, a bigger portion than what your body wanted. Um, and so what we do is we test, it doesn't have to be every meal, but we test every, you know, every so often, once or twice a day over the course of a couple of weeks. And we start to learn really, really specifically exactly how much we can get away with at any given meal without spiking our blood sugar to a level that it's really causing a stress on our body, right? And so if that first meal was that sort of carb heavy, you know, pasta and chicken and, um, and garlic bread that we talked about, you know, if the next day you could even try that same meal, but maybe you reduce your portions, right? Maybe you eliminate the garlic bread, or maybe we use a pasta instead of pasta, we're using spaghetti squash, Basically, we make adjustments, we keep making refinements until we get to a point where the quantity and the amount of carbs altogether is low enough that we're not causing this massive stress by having our blood sugar spike. And so we really start to build an intuitiveness about what exactly our body can tolerate at any given setting. Um, and that also helps us drive exactly what sort of meal schedule is ideal for us. 
because for some people, you know, eating twice a day and being fasted for a significant portion of the day is really ideal for them. It's really spot on. It really gives them the, the best blood sugar ever. But for other people, especially when people are sort of, you know, having some blood sugar issues and they're in this transition phase, it's really better for them to eat smaller meals more frequently. And the reason is because they can't tolerate a big meal, right? Because even if they're eating relatively low carb, the amount of food sometimes is too big of a portion that their body isn't, it, you know, is just sort of ultra sensitive to the sugar and and starts to have some volatility to to the sugar going up and going down, which again is a big stress on the body, right? So we've got to get that under control in order for the body to sort of start to calm down, to not be feeling stress, so that all of those those areas of the body that had been ignored or neglected when when we're under stress can sort of come back online, right? So good digestion and good hormones, good reproductive system. We want all of those things to come back. But in order to do that, we have to get the stress down. We have to let the body calm down. And in order to do that, we have to get the blood sugar sort of under control. So in general, like I said, after a meal at about, at about 60 minutes, we're looking um, at an ideal situation would be a reading of 120 or less. And then at fasting, we're looking for somewhere between, it depends on sort of who you're asking. Um, in my training, the ideal number is somewhere between between 75 and 86. Other, I've seen other functional practitioners say somewhere between 80 and 90. So roughly it's somewhere between 75 and 90 is ideal um, at fasting. And this, and this means fasting means 12 hours since a meal. So basically like you went to bed the night before, you got up, you didn't have anything, and then you went and got your blood drawn. And anything that's higher than that does suggest that we've got some level of blood sugar issues. Which again, um, you know, like I said, you know, Sarah and I, we've, we've both managed to um, to correct our blood sugar issues. Mm -hmm. So if you do have issues, it absolutely is is fixable. It just takes sort of uh, you know knowing what to do or working with a practitioner who knows how to help guide you through that process. Yeah, so it's a very personalized approach and being really that's why that the whole you know this diet and try that diet where it's like let's see which diet is right for you. So um, mm -hmm. because we're all different. So that yeah, I think measuring things so you've got the the data it can be really key because sometimes when you have the when you when maybe when you have the gluten-free pasta and then afterwards yeah what is happening to you and and maybe to to pull back on that because i know when i switched to gluten-free i did a lot of gluten-free not junk but maybe some junk and how you know how was that you know impacting my blood sugar even though gluten was not great for me but then i was doing all those gluten-free grains which again it's to you know as you start to figure this out then you can figure out what's right right for your body so when we do so as part of our couples coaching program we do a blood chem review and it's to educate not uh, not to diagnose and we're looking at those those functional levels so you know a full panel uh, for the review and part of that is looking at the um the fasting blood sugar so those the the functional levels can you just do the functional levels versus the conventional and kind of why so the functional levels we're going to be catching it before it actually goes to disease it's for people with you know going for optimal health whereas the conventional side is for um people that have disease so it, it'll it'll flag it later so when we're doing the review for the fasting blood sugar, the reference range is, can you just uh, reiterate that for us? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a, that's a great point. So yeah, in general, from a functional perspective, we know that the ideal situation for a fasting glucose is somewhere between 75 and 90. Um, and again, depending on who you ask, the, the upper end is maybe 86. So and it's somewhere between 75 and 90 anyhow. But a doctor in general um, doesn't really see it that way. So essentially, if, if your fasting glucose is above, I think the number is 126, that's when they diagnose it as as diabetes. Um, and if fasting glucose, I think 100 is the cutoff, is above 100, that's when they diagnose it as pre-diabetic. So of course, you know, this, there's this difference between, you know, 86 or 90 and 100 or 120, right? And so even at a, you know, between 100 and 120, where you're sort of in this pre-diabetic phase, um, a doctor will basically, in a lot of cases, right, I don't, I don't want to speak for all of Western medicine, but in a lot of cases, they basically say, okay, well, you need to sort of watch what you eat and you need to sort of get some more exercise. And that's, that's sort of the, uh, the urgency with which it's talked about, right? And so not until it's, it's bad enough that it's diagnosable as diabetes, does it really become a major concern for doctors? And that's the difference between Western medicine and, 
and functional medicine in general is that, you know, doctors are really there to take care of us um, when we're, when something has gotten bad enough that you're sort of at risk, right? Their job is to keep you safe and to make sure that you, that you're whatever disease you have doesn't get bad enough that you're that you're at risk, right? In functional medicine, we take a different approach. And the approach is that we don't care whether it's bad enough for it to be a disease. We want to know, are you within the sweet zone? Are you within the sweet spot of actually being healthy? Because there's this whole window between 86 and 100 that we know isn't ideal, right? And it doesn't mean that you need to drop everything you're doing and quit your job to start working out six hours a day. But it means like it's time for us to start to start writing the ship. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're you're trending in the wrong direction and you're heading down that road. And it will, you know, if left unchecked, if nothing changes, you know, if your if your blood sugar has has gone up over the years, um, and you don't change anything, right? You don't start getting better sleep and you don't start getting more movement and you don't change your diet, then it's going to continue to trot to trend in the wrong direction where your fasting glucose continues to get higher and higher. Um, and whether or not it turns into full blown diabetes really depends on genetics and, and many other factors, right? So do you have some, uh, liver stress and do you have sort of all of these other little things going on that also sort of contribute to your body's overall level of wellness? But we know that, that once some, something sort of passes outside of the functional range that we're getting in that suboptimal zone where the body is really saying like, really, we need to do something in order to get this back on track or we're headed in the wrong direction. So I know we've talked quite a lot about the, the glucose levels. The hemoglobin A1C is, right. is roughly the same thing. You know, like in a, from a functional standpoint, we're looking at uh, somewhere, somewhere under 5.5%. And the Western cutoff is usually somewhere around eight. And depending on sort of who you're asking, sometimes we'll say, well, at about a seven, it's dicey and, and other Western resources will stay somewhere around a nine. And the, but the difference between like what we we think is ideal from a functional standpoint and what what the what Western medicine thinks is ideal is really a, like a tremendous difference. Mm -hmm. The gap is really big, so it's really um, a big area where because in functional medicine we don't care whether it's diagnosable as a disease, right? We just care whether or not you're going in the wrong direction, and we want to get you back on track. We want to get you feeling great because that's ultimately what lets us have the life we want to have, where we feel good, we're able to make babies. You know, everything is sort of working the way that it's supposed to, as opposed to just is this so bad that it's diagnosable as a disease? Exactly. And yeah, as part of the fat fertile method, we're, we're looking at the functional testing. So we're looking at food sensitivity testing, hormone testing using urine. We're looking at stool testing, looking at the DNA of your stool. We're looking at hair tissue mineral analysis testing. So using those tests as the, as the foundation and then doing blood chem review for both you and your partner. So no matter what, because a lot of times we get this, this infertility diagnosis, you know, low AMH or uh, premature ovarian insufficiency or diminished ovarian reserve, PCOS, endo, whatever the diagnosis. And we myopically focus on the diagnosis. And meanwhile, in the body, there's the, the functional tests are telling, you know, there's a food sensitivity, you've got a gut infection. Oh, wait, we're looking at your blood chem. And again, we're not diagnosing, we're educating. Oh, wait, there's there's blood sugar imbalance where your blood sugar is popping all over all, you know, all day long. So it is, it all tells a story and we put it all together. And then you become very knowledgeable about, first of all, your body. Like for me, for years, I was totally disconnected, had no clue. And my body's like, as you were saying before, your body's like yelling. And I'm like, I don't know. Like I had, I just thought I was an irritable person or that I, you know, I would feel tired certain times a day, whatever it was, my, you know, my, my energy levels. So now I can, I'm very in tune as to what, what is off and what potentially caused it. And a lot of times it can be stress. And so, yeah, it is being able to, to be able to tune into your body, see what's right for you, know the numbers, know the data. That's why we work with a lot of people that have that, as you keep saying, like nerdy, but that like that science mind, like a left, a left brain kind of person um, that likes all the, the data. And it's equally as important though, to, you know, when you're trying for your baby to, to, go into that right side too, or looking at your intuition and intuitively eating and listening to your body. That's equally as important with, you know, with the, with the, the, the science side of things. I completely agree. And the, the left side of the brain helps with that too, right? Because, you know, if we, if we get some of the science right in the, in the early days, and we see this with our clients all the time, right? In the first couple of months, they start to feel so much better mm -hmm. based on the work that we've done together that, now they have the ability to clue in. And I, I know you have sort of a similar story as me, Sarah, where I used to feel so crummy all the time that I could never tell any particular food made me feel crummy or that any particular behavior made me feel crummy. And it was because I felt so crummy all the time that it was just, it was just this baseline of crummy, right? But once I started feeling better, now I know exactly which foods are triggers for me, exactly which foods are going to make me feel like crap and are a risk for me to eat. Um, and the same thing with our clients, right? Now they just have this, this built-in sense of intuitiveness. They know, Oh, 
which foods are problematic. They know that if they go to sleep way too late one night, that they feel crummy the whole next day or that they have sugar cravings the next day or whatever it may be, because now you're sort of in a position to be able to draw these connections between, between the, the foods that we eat and the behaviors that we have and how we're feeling. Yeah. And even if you're not feeling poorly, because I looking back, I'm like, I still thought I felt like I still thought I was okay. I even though I looking back, I'm like, what the heck was going on there? But I actually thought I, I would have said if someone asked, how's your health, I would have said great. <laughs> and most and most people that come to us is like not a sick population. It's a population that's trying to have their their child and wait a minute, you know, the body wants to survive, not procreate. So what's going on? And then as we tune into things, sometimes we don't know how poorly we're feeling until we start feeling freaking awesome. So it is that low level of like, oh, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. And then, you know, it will get to like, I had that crashing halt where I started getting all these infections and loaded myself up with all these antibiotics. And then, you know, then that, that my, my health came to a, you know, a grinding halt, but you don't need to, you don't need to wait for the crash. You can do things right now, as you say, to right the ship. And I, I like, I like that analogy. And so as far as like complications of high blood sugar and low blood sugar, so high blood sugar, you could have fatigue or chronic fatigue syndrome, low energy levels, those sugar and carb cravings. I literally was like, give me, like, I could not finish a meal without dessert. It was just like, I, I grew up like that. And I, my meal was not complete unless I had something sweet. Now, you know, I still will like sweet things, but it's not all the time. Excessive thirst. I was like chronically dehydrated. I know, I don't think I even drank water. I, I drank, I peed once a day, thought it was great. Um, but yeah, obviously for, if you've got high blood sugar, excessive thirst is like one of the things I think we all know for, for diabetes or, or insulin resistance, uh, weight fluctuations, weight loss, increased urination, headaches, trouble concentrating. So those are kind of like the, 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 some of those common symptoms that we all know that you know, I think we, I think we know those, uh, the low, the low blood sugar is what I was kind of experiencing more of with the mood swings, the nervousness, the jit the jitteriness. So I'd get like that, like, yeah, just like shaking, blurred, um, vision, worsening vision, didn't have that slow healing of wounds, dryness, cuts, bruises, frequent and inf fret infections. So I was getting that a lot, heavy breathing and trouble exercising, tension, headaches, sweating. A lot of times, yeah, like that'll happen to happen to my daughter. Actually, she'll be like, feed me now when she's like sweating and nervous. And I'm like, okay, how much carbs have you been having? But yeah, and that extreme hunger and slight, slight uh, nausea. So those are some of the, the, the symptoms. So let's go back into what it means with the, the hangry piece again, just to, just to reiterate that for people. Yeah. You know, so for the most part, when, when you're getting hangry, right? So that's, uh, I'm sure everybody knows what that word means by now, right? That's when we're starting to feel uh, irritable because we're hungry, basically. But, you know, we don't always necessarily know even that we're as hungry as we are. And, and it's not even related to hungry, right? So it's more about a drop in our blood sugar and our body is starting to give us signals. It, our body's starting to say, like, listen, it's really important that you stop the things that you're doing and you focus on finding food. And right in this, we have to think of our, of our bodies, our humans as primitive objects, right? Like we, back in the day... If our blood sugar was dropping, that really was critical to our to our ability to survive, right? Our bodies needed to give us the signal like, okay, you need to stop what you're doing and you need to find some kind of sustenance and you need to do it now or you're going to be in danger. Um, and that's essentially what's going on is that our, our body is giving us signals that your blood sugar is dropping. That's not an okay situation. It is a risk to you being able to survive and you've got to do something about it. You've got to put something in your belly that's going to change your blood sugar situation. Um, and that's why it gives us, you know, not only the hangry symptoms, but, but everything else, right? So this, all those things that you just described to us, right? Our mood swings, we start to feel jittery. We start to, to actually feel sick to the stomach. Um, we start to get a headache or we start to get weak or shaky. Um, the body's really giving us all these clues that we, that we need to, to, it stops us dead in our tracks. Basically it makes it so that we can't just go on and we can't keep playing the, the, ba the baseball game we're playing, or we can't keep, you know, sitting at our desk for another three hours. We have to stop what we're doing and take care of it. And then let's talk about, uh, briefly with this, this, how stress impacts blood, blood sugar as well. Yeah. So again, you know, for the most part, it's the, it's this roller coaster that happens, right? You know, if we eat a diet, that's got a lot of sugar in it or a lot of carbs, right? And so again, like if we're having pasta and cereal and and other other really grain heavy meals and sugar heavy meals, right? And then we're following it up with a bowl of ice cream or a Snickers bar after lunch or whatever it may be, um, then we're constantly giving our body a lot of sugar and our, our blood sugar rises, it spikes higher than we want it to. And then the body tries to counteract that and balance it out. But in the meantime, what happens is we have this dip that happens. 
And so it's sort of like this, um, like sine wave, if you guys are familiar with that from back from math class, um, you know, where it, it jumps up and then it comes down and then it jumps up and then it comes down and then it jumps up and then it comes down. Ultimately, you're going to stay like a really tiny sine wave where it's really following across this roughly the same line and staying as, as linear as possible. But what happens is when we start to eat a lot of sugar, we sort of get stuck in this pattern where it raises a lot after a meal and then it drops down quite a bit, right? And so you guys all know what it comes, you know, the sugar crack right? Especially in children, we see it where they eat sugar and they sort of are off the walls for a little while. Um, and then, you know, it, as adults anyway, we at least experience the, the crash afterwards. Usually if we have some kind of dessert a while later, then we're feeling sort of sluggish, sort of drowsy, sort of whatever, not quite full of energy. Um, and this roller coaster is just a huge stressor on the body, right? And every time there's stress, body is, is producing cortisol, our stress hormone. And cortisol totally robs the body of all of the other resources. It literally limits its blood flow to our gut and to our reproductive system, right? So it's saying basically the environment here in this human body right now isn't the ideal environment to make a baby. Um, and so it's stopping all of those things because it's trying to keep us safe. And it doesn't matter whether we can make a baby or whether we digest our food perfectly or any of those other things or whether we can fight off infection. You know, None of those things matter if we don't survive the, the blood sugar spike. And so that's where the body has to put its resources. Um, and we know for a fact that cortisol, the stress hormone, body uses almost the, all the same ingredients to make hormones cortisol as it does to make our sex hormones, right? So it's using um, it's using a lot of the B vitamins and it's using some of our dietary cholesterol. Those are the exact resources our bodies use to make estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, right? And so there's this direct effect that happens to our ability to, to reproduce, to have a good, healthy, strong uh, reproductive system if we're constantly on this roller coaster and our body is constantly under that level of stress. Yeah. And then with sleep, which is, which is we work on you know in our couples coaching program for months on sleep and and uh, even having one night of dysregulated sleep, so interrupted or can't fall asleep uh, or, you know, waking up early uh, and not getting the full seven to nine hours, we recommend nine at the, at the, as, as the best goal, uh, that can then impact your blood sugar the entire next day. And sometimes people are, I, we regularly speak to people that have had sleep issues for years and years. And so that's a sign. So it's not, you know, like to me going to the fertility clinic and doing an IUI or an IVF and, and, you know, pushing this, obviously, you know, we can feel that we're in a panic and that's where we need to go. But if you've got issues going on with your sleep and that's impacting your blood sugar, which then, you know, is impacting, you know, your hormones, there's, there's simple things you can do to, to uh, improve this. Absolutely. Yeah. And so like you said, Sarah, sleep is an important one. We know because your your liver doesn't do all the things it's supposed to do at night if we don't get really the, the right length of sleep and the right uh, depth of sleep, right? And the liver is part of what sort of processes, your, the liver plays a role in blood sugar as well. And so like you said, we know that it's, um, that that can have an effect on our blood sugar for the whole next day. It also, we I just learned in the last day or two that your exposure to light can have a dramatic impact on your blood sugar, right? And so that if you get an appropriate amount of exposure to day to daytime light during the middle of the day, that that actually has the possibility of lowering your blood sugar by a couple of points, basically. So essentially, like every input that we give the body is is either a healthy input or a not healthy input, right? And so things like some sunlight exposure midday and a good deep quality sleep, um, those things are good inputs and those things help send our blood sugar in the right direction. And anything that's the opposite of those. So, um, you know, like for me, for example, today, I'm in an office in the basement, right? And there's not a ton of, of light. So it's important that I actually step outside at some point during the day and get some direct sunlight. Otherwise, that has potential to have a negative impact on my blood sugar, um, you know, as does any of the other things we talk about, right? Again, so with the exercise, it's the same thing, that it has a connection as well. The name of the game here is we want to reduce stress from every way possible and we want to stack the deck in our favor, you know, in all the little ways that we can because they all directly or indirectly have an impact on our, on our overall blood sugar balance and on our overall health in general. Yeah. So if you can, during your lunch hour, take a break, go for a walk, uh, walk without the sunglasses, which may seem like weird without sunglasses, but yeah, you need to get that, that actual light for, for 20 minutes. Okay. So let's talk about some strategies here that we can balance the, um, our blood sugar. What can we do right now? So let's talk about diet. What are your, what are your top tips for diet? Yeah. So my absolute, and this sort of goes for almost everyone is to to focus on on good healthy fats, um, and so maybe we should just touch for a second on what those are. So good healthy fats are um, are things like avocados and avocado oil, coconut oil. 
olive oil, uh, real butter if you tolerate dairy, and then any healthy meat fats. So any fats from any from any animals that are, that were raised in a good healthy way. Um, and bad fats are not helpful for us though. So things like canola oil, vegetable oil, um, safflower oil, uh, anything that's been deep fried, those are not good fats. So fats, um, when they're good fats, are some of the most important things. Oh, it's so nuts and seeds. Those are also great sources of fats. Um, so those are that's the really sort of the most important thing in our diet. And then having a good sort of moderate amount of protein in the diet and keeping carbs relatively low. And this is true for, you know, almost every human on the planet, basically, you know, so we, we talk about, you know, no one diet is right for everyone, but there are some principles that do apply to everyone. And that is the, the lower we, we stay in carbs in general, or, you know, in that amount you know, low is not a very specific number. <laughs> that amount can vary from person to person. And for some people, you know, that that might mean 20 grams in a day. Um, that would be very low carb. For other people, maybe we're talking more like, you know, 150 grams in a day. But this standard American diet has significantly more than that, right? We're like, we're eating primarily carbs. And I know that that was what my diet was back in the day that I, you know, I ate pasta and pizza for every meal, right? I was, I only ate uh, veggies and meats when I was trying really hard to do something good for myself, but it was a rarity because because I loved the carbs. Um, so in general, keeping carbs low is the most important thing. So we want to focus on our fats and our proteins first, and then finding the, the the eating cycle that works for you, right? And so like I talked about earlier, you know, for some people, this may be um, one or two meals a day, but if your blood sugar can't tolerate that, which mine certainly couldn't have years ago, then you do need to eat more frequently and you need to eat smaller meals. And the reason is, you know, you sort of can't sustain a reasonable blood sugar level for long enough, right? So if you're in that zone where you have to eat every couple of hours, well, then for the time being anyway, you do need to continue to eat every couple of hours, but maybe you need smaller meals um, or maybe you need bigger meals or maybe we need to, to play with the fasting window. But the ultimate idea here is that, um, that it is different for everyone, but that we do want to keep carbs low and that we want to focus on foods that are serving our bodies, right? So in general, this is uh, veggies, meats, fruits, and healthy fats. Um, and then of course, you know, in moderation, nuts and seeds. But but uh, our, our typical recommendation is that we minimize the amount of grains or dairy in the diet. Um, and in some cases, legumes as well, um, because those just, they tend to not be as nutrient dense as the other foods. Uh, and they tend to be blood sugar spiking, right? So grains tend to tend to have a pretty big impact on the blood sugar raising up high. And those foods also just tend to be inflammatory. They all have things in them that that typically cause some level of aggravation at a at a chemical level for people. Yeah. So we're like from a general recommendation, we're looking at people doing the elimination diet to figure out the uh, if you have a food sensitivity, and then to take that to the next level is the AIP diet. So autoimmune protocol. You can check out. I've got a number of episodes on the AIP diet. So basically it's like, it's to keep it simple is to keeping out grains and focusing on wild caught fish and grass fed meats and veggies and, you know, some fruits. So it is, um, and it's not about starvation. It's not like you're drinking green juice all day long, which that, you know, people are doing the juicing, which then is in smoothies, which can spike, uh, spike blood sugar because it's full, filled, filled with, with fruit. But so I was looking at that diet and then another recommendation to get that gluc uh, the glucose meter. Can you just talk about that and what they need to look for for the, gl uh, the glucose meter? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. This is something that we recommend quite a lot. Um, so my, one of my favorite things, if someone is struggling with blood sugar issues at all is to just to start doing some testing. So it's pretty inexpensive. So you can get a, a glucose meter, at least in the United States, you can get one for somewhere between 20 and $30 usually. And then a set of 50 testing strips for about the same price. So for under 50 bucks, you usually, um, you can sort of get yourself set up with a glucose meter and with the testing strips that you need. And you can get them just about anywhere. So, you know, at your whatever your corner drugstore is in town or any of the superstores like Walmart or Target usually have these. Um, and so my recommendation to people uh, is usually to get whatever cheapest one they can find at whatever store is nearest to them. So that when you, um, if you do sort of get into it and you do need replacement testing strips, that they're at somewhere that's convenient for you to pick them up um, because you're, they're not sort of interchangeable from, you know, one brand's device to another brand's device. So, you know, if that happens to be a Rite Aid on the corner, um, then, you know, you just get the Rite Aid brand or wh whatever brand you like. But in general, the, the sort of the off name brand um, tends to work just as well as the more expensive ones. 
Um, and I've tried a number of them over the years. And so I've just bought whatever the grocery store brand is or the drugstore brand usually. And um, and it's really pretty straightforward. So all of the, the meters, they come with a, a lancet and needles and the testing strips. And so you just plug a testing strip in the little machine and you do put a little pinprick in your finger with the lancet. It's really easy to do. It comes with just a little button. So basically you sort of... you. You pull it back so that it's cocked and then you just you uh, have it touching your finger and you press the button and it just sort of puts a little, a tiny little jab in your finger. And then usually you don't even really have to squeeze. A little bit of blood comes out of that one little hole um, and you put some on the testing strip. And then it almost immediately, within a couple of seconds, gives you your reading. And like I said earlier, I encourage people to do this um, twi- you know, at two different kinds of times. So one is fasting. So like first thing in the morning, before you've had anything to eat and before you've had any exercise. And just to sort of do that every so often to sort to see what your baseline is and to see which direction you're trending in general, right? So that if say it's 95 today and, um, and you know, and you keep testing for a while and over a couple of weeks, well, now your average is more like an 84 or now your average is more like an 82 that you can actually start to see that you're, you're making progress. So it's, it's, you know, in black and white on paper, you can see proof that you're making progress in your, your overall average blood sugar level. And then of course, after meals. So, and that's when we want to see it, um, less than 120 at 60 minutes after a meal. Um, so basically we do the same thing. We eat dinner or we eat breakfast or we eat lunch. Um, and then we poke our finger an hour later and I Ideally, we're looking for that number to be below 120. And if it's not, again, that's sort of what helps us drive how we make adjustments to our meal the next time, right? And so if I if my blood sugar was more than 120, that's higher than I want. Well, then I know that, okay, next time, instead of half of a sweet potato, maybe I need to eat a quarter of a sweet potato. Or, you know, instead of the a squash, maybe next time let's go for something, a green vegetable instead that's a little less starchy. Um, and making little tweaks like that can make a big difference in how much you spike. Um, and it really depends on the person too. And so it's important for you to, to be testing your own blood sugar to see how your body responds to different to different things. I know in my case, um, white rice spikes my blood sugar quite a lot. And for other people, it doesn't have the same impact. So for me, I have to be really careful. And I almost always choose not to have rice if we ever, so say we go out to a restaurant um, where there is rice, I almost almost always choose not to have any. Or if I do, it's literally like a tablespoon or two because I know that having a big pile of rice, like other people have the luxury of being able to do, would really spike my blood sugar, would really be bad for me personally. Okay, great. So looking at diet, first tip, tip number two, getting that that glucose meter. Uh, tip number three, any final things? Uh, yeah, so you know, it's stress reduction, which the biggest things in my mind are always... Um, sleep, sweet, sleep quality, sleep quantity, sleep schedule, and then making sure that you're getting movement out there every day, right? So not only something that sort of gets your heart rate up, but also something that challenges your muscles a little bit. Excellent. Well, uh, thanks so much for coming on and talking about this topic of blood sugar. I think it's really important. I think a lot of people, they have the signs. We're not sure how that really impacts your fertility. And it's, it's again, not focusing on the diagnosis. It's looking at the whole body. And if you have any of the symptoms of uh, high or low blood sugar to really test and really see which is the diet that's that's right for you. So thanks a lot for being here, Justine. Thank you, Sarah. Melatonin is important for female fertility. It helps regulate hormones and maintain the body's circadian rhythms. Plus it helps determine the frequency and duration of the menstrual cycle. Plus it impacts sperm count and motility. Blue and green light negatively impact our melatonin production. That's why we recommend Blue Blocks, Blue and Green Light sleep glasses to all our one-to-one clients. Simply go to Blue Blocks, B-L-U, B-L-O-X dot and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast at checkout to receive your 15% discount. That's blue blocks, B L U B L O X.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the supercharger fertility discovery call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you are a U.S. resident, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E to 55444. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20 minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to our heart. 
These simple yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. For U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E, to 55444. For non-U.S. residents, go to Yoga Freebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E, to access your special gift. That's yogafreebie.com to access the free fertility yoga download. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.